Feel the power. Welcome to Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Welcome to the ever increasing world feast. I'm excited to welcome you, friends and family, right here on Facebook, YouTube, and all our social media handles. Abel Damina is my name. Listen, the truth of the word of God is when God's word is preached and taught, God's power to save is made available. Brother Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. I'm honored to serve you grace today to bring you clarity of teaching from the word of God. Invite a friend, a loved one, create watch parties, tag people because the word is going to come very hot and powerful today. You know, there's a mandate of God on my life to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. It is with that mandate in mind that this message is coming to you right now. It will change your life forever. However, remember the scripture tells us the time shall come when they shall not endure sound doctrine. The Greek word hugaino wholesome doctrine. There's an endurance required. So as you listen, please painstakingly and patiently listen to the teaching of God's word. Don't listen with a critical mind. Listen with a mind to learn. You know, Jesus said, learn of me for I am meek and lowly of heart and you shall find rest. So there's a meekness required. Brother James says, with meekness, receive the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. There's a meekness required and there's endurance required where sound doctrine is concerned. So you want to patiently follow the teachings. Most of my teachings are in a series. So get ready to follow. And if there's anything you don't understand, be patient. The teachings will continue to explain themselves until you come to a place of understanding and clarity in the knowledge of Christ. One more thing to say with you today. If you're in an area where there's no Bible teaching church, where the message of Christ like this is preached, you can start one or you can join any of our campuses. Our campuses are extension houses of our local church where brethren come together and they are fed, they are taught, they take responsibility, they pray together, they reach out to the people in their community with the truth of God's word. Our campuses are lighthouses in nations and cities and communities where believers come together and they are taught the word of God by myself. And I'm excited if you want to be a part of what we're doing around your community or you want to start one. All you need to do is shoot me a mail today, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. And we shall guide you on what to do to either begin one campus or join another. It's not good for you to be in isolation. The Bible says, do not dismiss the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. In prophecy, the word of God tells us that God will bring the solitary into families. You are a member of a family and there is no family that does not have a gathering. Our gathering is our assemblage to be taught, to be equipped, and to become responsible for other people's growth. It's so important, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you today. Lastly, there's a plethora of books I have written that addresses so many issues of the Christian faith. They're all on the screen. Look at this. Today, you can order for a book or two or all the set by shooting an email to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Including today's message, you can order for the CD or the DVD. The entire essence is to nourish you, enrich you, and equip you with robust understanding of your relationship with Almighty God. I'm excited to be able to serve you. Fasting your seatbelts. Let me take you right now into a gospel adventure, into the service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. We've been dealing with the book of Revelation, uh, the revelation of Jesus or the letters to the seven churches uh, in Asia. All right, Revelation chapter 1 verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. All right, so this is a revelation given to John, and this revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So that we are all on the same page, you know, most of us, four of the same chapter one. John to the seven churches, which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace. From him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. 
Next verse. And from Jesus Christ, and it tells you that Jesus we're about to study. Then from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. The first begotten. The prototokos. Okay? The first begotten of the dead. And the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And hath made us. So take note of the tenses. Jesus has loved us. He has washed us. He hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So he doctrinally establishes the position from which he is going to begin to share with us his visions, his interaction with angels, and the messages he had for these churches. But he begins, first of all, by establishing their position doctrinally on the finished work of Christ. He hath loved us, and we know the love of God is a sacrificial work of Christ. God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans chapter 5 verse 8. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So he establishes our position that we are already loved with an everlasting love. We are not going to be loved because we did something. We are loved before we knew to do anything. He loved us. And because he loved us, he went ahead to prove it. He washed us. He washed us with his blood. His death, his burial, his resurrection paid the price for our sins. Meaning he secured our salvation. He secured our salvation as a sota of salvation. And then, because he has now saved us, he has made us kings and priests unto our God. That's the position from which we function. That's where we operate from. That's where we, 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 are, we are rooted in. That's our position in Christ. Now, so whatever is going to write to these seven churches, the first thing he has told them is their status in Christ. So meaning that what he's about to tell them has nothing to do with salvation. Because he has already told them that they are loved, they are washed, and they are made. So whatever is going to tell them has to do with the things we're going to look at. And I don't want to get ahead of myself. That's why I am not giving you a, 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 you know, a definition for it. But we have looked at three churches already. We have looked at three churches. We have looked at the church in Ephesus. We have looked at the church in, 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 in Pagamos. And we have looked at the church in Simna. And this evening we are looking at the church in Teatra. Teatra. Revelation chapter 2 verse 18 to 29. And unto the angel of the church in Teatra, write, This thing say of a son of God, who had his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works. I know thy works. And charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works. And the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in theatre, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, that, but that which you have already, hold fast till I come. Next verse. And he that overcometh and keepeth my words unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a porter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So again, he first commends their works. 
I know your works. I know your charity. I know your service. I know your faith. And I know your patience. That's where he always begins for it by commending their works. Then in verse 20, he spells out the things he detected that were wrong in that church. Notice also, the issue with this church is doctrine. Did you observe that all the churches we have studied so far, the issues were doctrine? The church in Ephesus, the church in Pagamos. There's only one church that was not indicted. The church in Simna. Simna had such a good record. All they had was commendation. God had nothing against the church in Simna. But we saw that the church in Pagabos had a problem with the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And I will talk about that a little more. And the doctrine of Balaam. We also saw that the church in Ephesus had a problem with the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Which we will talk about later. And God said, which thing I hate. So now we're looking at the church in Tetra, And all of these are doctrinal issues. All of them are doctrinal issues. All of these are people who, I mean, churches that allowed wrong doctrine to come in, wrong teachers to come in, wrong preachers to come in, with wrong teachings, and they accommodated them. And God said, I have something against you. You are polluting my message. You are allowing people to pollute the sacredness of the finished work of Christ. You are allowing people to come in with teachings that make caricature of what Christ has suffered for. You are allowing doctrines to be peddled in your congregation that exalt human works and activities above what christ has done and god said i hate it and it's happening all over today in churches all over the place and i'm going to get into that in a bit so now he says i have a problem with this church and his doctrine he said to teach and seduce doctrinal to teach you have allowed that woman jezebel to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols so what did he mean by to commit fornication and eat things sacrificed to idols? Let's do some exegesis on that. The word allow, you have allowed, is translated from the Greek word aphemai. A-P-H-I-E-M-I. Aphemai, which implies to give allowance to or allow to go. To give allowance to or allow to go. Alright, so the next word is to seduce. You have allowed her to seduce. The word seduce was translated from the Greek word planao. P-L-A-N-A-O. Planao. Which implies to deceive or to cause to go astray. Planao. Now notice carefully. In Revelation chapter 2 verse 24. But unto you I say and unto the rest in theatre. As many as have not this doctrine. And which have not known the depths of Satan. As they speak. I will put upon you none other body. Alright. So the statement, as many as have not this doctrine implies, that did not have the doctrine at first. That this doctrine of Jezebel was not part of the church. It was not in that congregation. The only message that was in the church in theatre was the purity of the message of Christ. Was Jesus and Jesus alone. It was not the teaching of Jesus plus. It was not the teaching of Jesus minus. It was Jesus and Jesus alone. But the people became complacent. The leadership became complacent. And they began to compromise. And began to, you know, allow certain strength teachings to enter into that congregation. And sometimes preachers of the gospel play politics with their pulpits. And I saw, I'm sure some of them are watching. That's why I'm making this point. Sometimes preachers of the gospel play, make politics. They use their pulpit for politics. And what I mean by politics is a preacher feels, if I do not invite a preacher to preach for me, he will not invite me to preach for him. Who cares? Keep your pulpit. I don't need your pulpit. If the only reason why me and you will relate is for me and you to share pulpit so you can come and corrupt what I'm teaching, I don't care about your pulpit. And I don't care what, where that pul what, what reach that pulpit has. That's playing politics. That's endangering God's people. That's being irresponsible as a pastor. I will not call you, and I don't care who you are, I will not call you to this sacred pulpit until I'm sure of what kind of bread you serve. I've got to be sure of what kind of bread you serve. Because we refuse as a church to eat from the table of the Lord and eat from the table of demons. We reject it as a church. Say, I hear you. And it is my responsibility as your pastor. Even if I don't find anybody, I have been solely and personally 
instructed by Jesus to have the responsibility to pastor this church. When I was sent to pastor you, there was no attachment to my assignment. God sent me to you specifically. And I don't need help with this work from another preacher. I have all the help I need here. All of you. It is my job to raise you to do the work of ministry. If I do my work well and I raise all of you, I will have more than enough help. See, I hear you. Yeah. So I'm not going to let anybody come up this pulpit and mess around with the sacredness of God's word and cause your minds to be unsettled. Because when people begin to hear from two different altars, and what I mean by two different altars is from two different preachings, which are coming from two different directions. One is focusing on works, and the other one is focusing on the finished work of Christ. Confusion is bound to abide. Our eyes must be focused. We all with open face. Only one thing. Beholding the glory of God where? As in a mirror. That's where our gaze should be on Christ and Christ and Christ and Christ alone. Say, I hear you. And I've made up my mind, I'm not going to use my pulpit for politics. Never. Because I value every one of you. Your souls are important to God. And everybody else that is in our campuses and follows me everywhere around the world on TV and online. I've made a commitment to the Lord Jesus. I will not use my pulpit for politics. Never. If a man stands behind this pulpit, whether in my absence or in my presence, he must have same food. Same diet that we're used to eating. He must have the same thing to give us. See, I hear you. Very important. Amen. And I've trained you good enough. If anybody by mistake stands here and he says rubbish, you will take care of him. You will reject, you will reject his food. When he brings the bread, you will throw it back on him. So to avoid calling us rude, let them stay where they are. We're happy to be where we are. If you're excited about that, say, I hear you. And I know you will never get tired of me. Whether you like it or yes. Except it's not Jesus you're looking for because we have more than enough Jesus to show here. Somebody shout hallelujah. So that's why a man of God must realize that the church he has been asked to pastor, he has the sole responsibility for that assignment. He has the sole responsibility. Look at what is becoming of the church in theatre. Just because of compromise. Wrong teachings have entered the congregation. And there's confusion because now it's Christ and other things. The doctrine of Jezebel, the depths of Satan have come into that church. People have been seduced to commit fornication and to eat food sacrificed to idols in the same church. Now very soon you will find out what it means to eat food sacrificed to idols and to commit adultery. The statement, as many as have not this doctrine, like I said, means that it was not part of the teachings of that church. It was not part of their practice. So he used the word suffer. That is, they allowed it. They have suffered Jezebel. They have allowed it. All right? Very important. Okay? Now, please you must remember. Part of the good work of the church, of this church, was that they had the doctrine of Christ. But there was another doctrine that came in. They had the doctrine of Christ. It's not as if they were not taught. It's not as if they were not taught. They were taught the message. It's just Christians that are, that are you know, are restless. Restless believers. Who are part of a church where you're fed, you're taught well. Then suddenly, you develop a restlessness. You start looking for variety. You feel like, uh-uh, our church, every time, Jesus, 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 I hear that there is a program in town, and one powerful man of God I've been watching on TV is coming. You sneak, and you go to attend the program, and then they feed you by force, the bread of, 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 of Satan. You eat it without thinking, and then, gradually, the pressure comes. You start compromising. And before you know it, you, you take one or two sisters from the church. I'm, I'm using sisters because sisters are very quick to do this kind of thing. You take one or two sisters from the church, two of you start attending the program. And then that day, fortunately or unfortunately, the man of God did and told you the history of your family. Ah! He said, so there is something like this. You are beginning to develop an unhealthy appetite. Very unhealthy appetite. Before you know it, you're gone. You have the doctrine of Christ, but now you have opened up to be seduced by Jezebel. Because you are restless. You are restless. You are not contented. You are greedy. And because you are greedy, you are eating from two tables. 
You are eating from the table of, law, of the Lord and you are eating from the table of devils. You are committing adultery. That's where the problem is. Including those of you watching on TV and those of you watching on Facebook and all the different campuses. When people cannot settle in one place and be rooted and be established and be fed when all their bodies always itching them to move around. Such people are dangerous. When somebody cannot show you exactly where he always is. When somebody is always everywhere. He's somebody to be careful with. Because if you know carry go, you go carry come. I don't know where I got that one from right now. Teaching good? They that are planted, there has to be a planting. You're rooted, you stay, you're grounded, you're established. Not moving around. When you see Jesus, what else are you looking for? So this church brought in strange things, which was not part of what was taught. Unlike the church at Ephesus, who had left their first love and were teaching the wrong teaching. At least this church still had the doctrine of Christ. But some people were trying to bring in a mixture into that congregation. So he further explained the doctrine which seduces believers into fornication and eating food offered to idols. And that doctrine is called knowing the depths of Satan. That doctrine is called knowing the depths of Satan. The word Satan was taken from the Greek word Satanas. Satanas. S-A-T-A-N-A-S. Satan. Satanas. Which implies opposition. In this context, an opposition to the doctrine of Christ. The depths of Satan is an opposition to the doctrine of Christ. The depth of Satan, you're not hearing me, is an opposition to the message of Christ. When people begin to say a believer needs deliverance. When that message is preached, it is an opposition to the gospel of Christ. Because the gospel of Christ says a believer has been delivered. But an opposition gospel or a doctrine of Satan or a doctrine of the depth of Satan says a believer needs deliverance. It's an opposition gospel. How can a believer be needing deliverance? What does it mean to believe? What does it mean to be born again? How can a born, be, born again believer be saying he is possessed? Possessed by what? He is bought with a price. He is bought with a price. He has been bought spirit, soul, and body. His spirit and his body and his soul are God. He has the mind of Christ. What are you delivering him from? It's fraud. It's fraud. Amen. The depth of Satan. Opposition against the finished work of Christ. Opposition to the gospel. This is similar to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 verse 21. The synoptics. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples. How that he must go unto Jerusalem. And suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes. And be killed. And be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Opposition. Peter began to rebuke him saying. Be it far from thee Lord. This shall not happen. You will not die. Jesus, you will not die. Peter was rebuking Jesus. Look at what Jesus answered Peter. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, Satanas, an opposition. Get thee behind me, opposition. Thou art an offense unto me. Thou art an offense unto me. Any message, if you are truly born of God and you are matured in the message, any message that is not predicated on the finished work of Christ should be an offense to you. When you are hearing it, it should be offending you. You cannot hear it and be happy and be comfortable and be saying, let us see where it is going. It is going nowhere. Once it is not predicated on what Christ has done, it is an opposition gospel. It's an opposition gospel. Just like there are opposition parties. This one is an opposition gospel. Satanas. Get it behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. Why? For thou savorest not the things that be of God. 
when a man a brother a sister a man of god does not serve the finished work of christ tell him to get behind you satanas satanas it's even more powerful than the english one get it behind me satanas you serve all the things that be of god but those that be of men teaching good If I'm teaching good, can I hear a good amen? Okay. So, the, he used the word burden, which implies responsibility. It was for them to hate and despise and speak against this doctrine. That's the responsibility of the church. To speak against this doctrine. To despise this doctrine. To hate this doctrine. That's the job of the church. He described the doctrine as that of false prophetess Jezebel. The doctrine of Jezebel. It is the job of this church to resist anything that comes on this pulpit you resist it vehemently don't even be nice about it anything trying to rob you of your reality in christ don't even be nice about it trying to rob you of what jesus suffered for amen I said amen. And what is the job of this, uh, of this teaching? Is to seduce. To lead the servants of God astray. To lead God's people into error. Now the name Jezebel therefore has a figurative expression. Alright. As a figurative expression. Jezebel is a figure of speech. It's a teaching which seduces and causes believers to go astray. The doctrine of Jezebel. It seduces, it's a metaphor. It seduces and causes believers to go astray. So the fornication there and eating of sacrificed food to idols was not literal fornication. And it was not literal eating of food sacrificed to idols. But it was a figurative expression of what this false teaching does. A figurative expression of what this false teaching does. So he brings in what he used earlier on with the church at Pagamos, the doctrine of Balaam. What is it called? The doctrine of Balaam. What is the doctrine of Balaam? Well, the doctrine of Balaam there, which is a teaching that inspires greed and covetousness in believers. A teaching that inspires greed and covetousness in believers. A teaching that is about, you know, measuring with material acquisition. A materialistic gospel a message of materialism every time how to get there every time five steps to make it every time don't give up the Lord will soon make it happen all testimonies are based on I bought a car I built a house I just got a contract I just marry a wife God is good when all the focus is on material things it is the doctrine of Balaam when the through word of a believer in a congregation is measured by his material acquisition, it is the penetration of the doctrine of Balaam. Psalm 91. $91 for 91 blessings. The doctrine of Balaam. Psalm 32. $32 for 30, 32 blessings. is the doctrine of Balaam. God is not a money doubler. God is not MMM. You don't give to God and he doubles it. No, that's fraud. Say, I hear you. So, the doctrine of Balaam is a doctrine that creates greed and covetousness. It's a, a teaching that brings inside believers, you know, greed. It inspires greed. And then there's a word called fornication. Translated from the Greek word, pornio, which implies to indulge in a lawful act of sex. To indulge in a lawful act of sex. Okay? Literally or figuratively. It's either literal or figurative. And I'm going to show you the two areas where they are used. Brother Paul used that same word, pornio, in his letter to the church at Corinth. And in that church, he was talking about literal fornication. First Corinthians 6 18. See the way he applies it. Flee fornication. 
every sin that a man doeth is without the body. So he's talking about physical, you know, unlawful act of sex. But he that committed fornication sinned against his own body. All right? So he's dealing with, you know, uh, unlawful act of sex here. All right? And then Brother Paul also, you know, uses the same word in, in that church at Corinth when he was indicting them of their, you know, uh, of their immorality. But in Revelation, the writer of Revelation, in Revelation 220, where we are talking about, he was using the word fornication as a figure of speech. It was figurative. He used the same word in Revelation 2.14. But I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Consistently, he spoke of eating things offered to idols, then buttressing the fact that that thing that you eat that is offered to idols is fornication. That's what he meant. That eating what is offered to idols is fornication. Okay, and it was figurative. See how he uses the word in other places in the same book. Revelation 17, 1 to 2. And there came one of the seven angels who had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that seated upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. This cannot be physical. This is metaphor. This is a figure of speech. Look at another one, Revelation 18 verse 3 and nine the way he used it for all nations have drunk of the wine of the rot of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are works rich through the abundance of her delicacies this cannot be physical fornication because there is no one woman that all the kings of the earth have committed fornication with where will that woman have been that all the kings you know all the kings including the ones in your village all the kings of the earth so it has to be metaphorical. Look at Revelation 18 verse 9. You see the way he uses it again. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived del deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. So these are metaphors. Metaphors. And all uses here are figurative. Just like we said. The fornication and immorality here was spiritual. Idol worship of, or idolatry. Idol worship or idolatry. The phrase sacrifice to idols was translated from the Greek word edolothuton, E-I-D-E-L-O-T-H-U-T-O-N, from which you will find the word edolon, meaning idols. And you will see the use of that word idols in 1 John 5.21. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Idols. Believers are to stay away or keep themselves away from idols. But in that church, they allowed the teaching of Jezebel, which seduced people to idol worship and fornication and eating things sacrificed to idols. In that particular church, you know, that church in Revelation where we are, Theatra. Look at 1 Thessalonians 1 9. For they themselves show of what of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. And how we turned, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. You turned from idols to serve the living and true God. Look at the way he, he used it again here in 2 Corinthians 6 16. And what agreement had the temple of God with idols? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Notice. The believer is the temple of God. The unbeliever is described as idols. Unbelievers are idols. Believers are the temple of God. So he now says, what fellowship or agreement has a believer with idols? An unbeliever. The temple of God with an unbeliever is the temple of God with an idol. So a man that does not believe the gospel of Christ is referred to as an idol. Now, an idol here does not refer to an image. 
It does not refer to a particular altar somewhere or a sanctum where people come and kneel down. An idol in this context is self. Self. When self becomes more important than the finished work of Christ. When self becomes more important than God, then self becomes an idol. An idol of selfishness. An idol of self. The new birth thrives on the indwelling of the spirit that causes us to naturally serve God. An unbeliever is without the spirit, so he serves self. An unbeliever serves himself. The God of an, of an unbeliever is himself. He has no God elsewhere. He doesn't care about anybody. He only cares about himself. The believer lives a life of the spirit. And a life of the spirit makes him care about others. The love of God makes you reach out to others. You care about others. You look after the welfare of others. Amen. So the worship of idols is selfishness. The worship of idols in that church is selfishness. So the teaching of Jezebel, which seduces or leads the servants of the Lord astray, is materialism. Again, materialism. A message that is all about self. You know what I mean? Self. I'm thinking of myself. So even if there is a cause where the gospel needs money, where the gospel needs money to reach out to people, you think of self first. And when you think of self, you don't have anything left for the gospel. So self is what you are serving. You're not serving God, you're serving self. I hope you know Jesus said, you cannot serve God and mammon. Hello? You cannot serve God? Clear. You cannot serve two of them. You're either serving God or you're serving mammon. So when your Christianity is about what will God do for me? How will God do it? When will God do it? God do for me. God do for me. God do for me. God do for me. Pray the Lord. He has done it again. The Jeep is outside. The Jeep is outside. The Lord has done it again. I just built a house. When that is all your testimony, you're serving yourself. Many people do not serve God. They use God to serve themselves. You didn't understand what I said. They do not serve God. They use God to serve themselves. Father, you said before December, I will buy a car. You came through prophet so and so. And the prophet shook his head, hit his leg, clapped his hand, shook his head and said, in the next three months, my daughter, I see you. I see you working for United Nations. They give you car and house. And if I be a man of God, but the next time I'm back to this church, you will be in that mansion. From that day, that sister has left Christ. Her vision, her dream, her prayer, her fasting. If she comes to church and we are preaching, she's not hearing Christ. She's looking for what we will say that will make that mansion come to pass. When we say, let us pray for evangelism. Ah, I'm not interested. Now, we want to pray. That thing you are believing God for. In the next three months, it has to happen. Clap your hands, shake your head, stamp your feet. She will shake and hit people. Because that prophet has swayed her from Christ. He has seduced her with self-worship. Did you hear what I said? With what? Self-worship. And there are many people in our churches who are not worshipping God. They are worshipping self. It's idolatry. They are given to idolatry. They have been seduced to commit fornication. The Jezebelitan spirit in a metaphor is at work in them. So they are using God to meet their needs. They are using God. They will not pray until they are sure God will do it. So anybody that will preach what will make them achieve their physical desires. That is a man of God. But anybody that comes to talk about Christ, the finished work of Christ, 
Our inheritance is not material. That thing in them, that idolatry is provoked. Is provoked. And I don't even want to preach in those churches. Because I've been to some of those churches. I've been there. Where their appetite is about self. If you preach and you don't talk about their problems will be solved. You didn't preach. They will tell their pastor, don't bring him. They will tell their pastor, don't bring that man of God to this church again. Because there are some churches where you go there to preach, where you live, their pastor will do a feasibility study. Of the three men of God that came to our convention, which of them do you people want to come back again? Then the church will vote. Are you understanding? How I know is that I went to some churches and I know I don't want to call names. And when I left, they said the pastor came up and said there were four guest speakers in this convention. One, two, three, they called our names and I was one. Which of them do you want back? The whole church shouted, Dr. Damina! And the pastor wasn't happy. Because what I preached did not massage self. I took their eyes from him and I put it on Christ and he was angry. And the pastor decided I won't come back. So now when he asked his church, who do you want? And they shouted my name. I'm sure in his heart he said, till you die, you won't see him here. <laughs> I have one assignment to put the spotlight on who? Christ. That's my assignment. And if you don't want it, don't bring me to your church. I'm warning you. Because even if I hold your microphone for 30 minutes, I will move your people from you to Christ. I am gifted. It's an apostolic thing. Once I hold the microphone, give me 30 minutes of exegesis. By the time I shoot, boom, 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 scriptures, and I'm bringing Christ out. Ba, 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 ba. By the time I give you a microphone, nobody will see you again. Nobody will see you again. I am gifted. It's a calling. It's an assignment I carry. It's an assignment, except I don't hold the microphone. I'm not joking, I'm very serious. By the time I finish one service, they make the mistake of giving me four days. Your church will even remember that you are a pastor in that place again. When I came among you, I desire to know nothing. Save Christ and him crucified. I thought somebody would shout, glory! glory! The pastor has not called me again. Even though the church, they are busy writing him. We want Dr. Damina. Some of them will even come on Facebook and inbox me. Dr. Damina, tell our pastor to invite you. Dr. Damina, tell our pastor to invite you. So me, I will write back. Tell your pastor to invite me. Nobody asks a man to invite him. All of you gather, tell your pastor to invite me. He said, we have been telling him he's doing like he's not hearing us. The next time they saw me, I will tell you, it's time for you to leave that church. It's time for you to leave the place. Any place where people don't want to hear Christ is not a church. It's an event center. It's an NGO. The church of Jesus feeds on Jesus. If I'm teaching good, say I hear you. Leave that in. Just calm down, calm down, calm down. Amen. Self is gone. It is no longer I that lives, but Christ who lives in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I thought somebody would shout hallelujah. So this doctrine is the same with the doctrine of Balaam, which causes believers to worship self. And how do they worship self? Through covetousness and greed. Peter also used the same word adultery figuratively to refer to greed and covetousness. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 14 to 16. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and hearts they have exercised with covetous practices, caused children. Caused children. What kind of children? Caused children. 15. Which are forsaking the right way and are gone astray. Following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. He loved what? The wages of unrighteousness. But was rebuked for his iniquity. 
the dumb are speaking with man's voice for bad the madness of the prophet i like in james bible did you see the way he used the english there but was rebuked for his iniquity the dumb are speaking with man's voice for bad the madness of the prophet he forbade the madness of the prophet i like that english please make sure you forbade them this guy loved the wages of unrighteousness greed selfishness covetousness the doctrine of balaam and it's big in our churches and there must be an army that will abort that doctrine completely out of the church say i hear you and that army is here today all over the world from sea to sea from coast to coast from nation to nation from continent to continent from city to city from village to village the message of christ exalted christ glorified will be the only thing that people will hear if you're a witness shout i hear you jude also spoke about it jude 1 11 war unto them for they have gone in the way of cain I ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. The error of Balaam is war, reward, greed, covetousness. And where did they perish? In the gainsaying of call. Balaam. The key thing about the doctrine of Balaam is materialism, greed, and covetousness. And this can be seen historically in the book of Numbers 22-21. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went to the princes of Moab. Okay? Look at Numbers 23, 18 to 24. And he took up his parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear. Hear unto me, hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Had he said, and shall he not do it? Or had he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless. And he had blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He had not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Neither had he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord is God is with him. And the shout of a king is among them. God brought them out of Egypt. He hath as it were the strength of a unicorn. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob. Neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel. What God hath wrought. 24. Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink of the blood of the slain. Next verse. And Balak said unto Balaam, Neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. And Balaam answered and said to Balak, Told I not thee, saying, All that the Lord speaketh that I must do. Next verse. And Balak said unto Balaam, Come, I pray thee. I will bring thee on to another place. But adventure it will please God that thou mayest cause me them from thence. And Balak brought Balaam onto the top of Peor that looked toward Jesimon. Balaam, for money, was running around looking for how to cause Israel. He was a prophet given to covetousness and eventually idol worship. All right? Balaam. The doctrine of Balaam, the way of Balaam, the counsel of Balaam. Greed. He was referring to a teaching. In Revelation 2, 22 to 23, as I round up, are you blessed tonight? Behold, I will cast into a bed, and them that commit adultery will turn into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill our children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. The statement, them that commit adultery with her, implies ministers who through their teaching, who through their teaching of Balaam, seduce and cause people to go astray. Any man of God that through the doctrine of Balaam is teaching people to go astray. Teachings like so a hundred thousand, God will make you a millionaire. No, that's fraud. That's stealing. That's stealing. Teachings like give. God will give you more than you can carry in your house. Your storehouse will be full. There will be nowhere to put money. Hey? That's fraud. That's stealing. See, I hear you. Yeah, those kind of teachings. Teachings that make God look like a money doubler. And many people like those kind of teachings. 
And he said, those ministers that cause people to go astray, that lead believers into the error of idol worship, the error of Balaam, brought by greed and covetousness. And his clear instruction for them is to repent. That is to desist from that kind of ministry. It shows the difference between the servants of God and false prophets. Am I, am I communicating? And he says he will kill our children with death. It cannot be literal. In this context, to kill is the word, to kill is the Greek word apok, apokteno. It was used by Paul in Ephesians 2.16. Having slain the enmity thereby. So to kill means I will cause them to cease. I will cause them to cease. God wants to reconcile them. He wants them to repent. But if they refuse to repent and harden themselves, he said he will take away the candlestick to bring them to an end. That is that thing they are doing will not survive. Now, I'm not saying this to rejoice over somebody's misfortune, but just to inform and, and, and talk to people that may be watching who are into that. A particular man of God somewhere stood up and told a few people, we are native doctors, openly. We, do, we are not called to take people to heaven. If you want to go to heaven, go to Dr. Damina. They are the ones called to take people to heaven. We, we are native doctors. We are here to collect people's money. And he was speaking it openly. Some ministers that overheard him saying it came and told me. I've never met this guy all my life. Few weeks ago, I heard they were doing an arm robbery raid around this compound where he lives. He came out with his small gun to confront the arm robbers. And they took him out. That Jesus, he said he has not been called to take people to. It is me that is called to take. He will face him. He will go and face him. He has actually faced him. I'm not rejoicing over it. But you know, when people do things, they do not even realize that life here is temporal. People don't realize. People don't realize. People just do things. Talk anyhow. Talk as if, you know, it, they have no regard for the word of God. God said, I will kill her with our children, with the children. I will, I will kill that, that spirit with the people that are proponents of it. Proponents of it. If she does not repent. When this letter was written, it was a warning to the church. When you hear me preach these messages with vehemence, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. I'm like a lone voice, but I'm bringing to the body of Christ a thus saith the Lord. Because judgment is already going on in the body of Christ. There's judgment going on. There's judgment going on. Judgment is going on. It has never happened before in the history of the church of Christ that people are suddenly waking up, including unbelievers, to x-ray the church. Even unbelievers are x-raying the church. Unbelievers are saying, Christianity should not be God for sale. Unbelievers are saying, if God is really God, why must we pay to know him? Unbelievers are x-raying the church. That's judgment. That's judgment. Judgment is going on. You know, I was sharing with Pastor Chris last year. I told him that I sense in my heart, few years from now, judgment will hit the church. Early this year, when these things began to happen, he called me and said, that judgment you spoke about has started. It's going on in the body of Christ. There's a sifting going on. There's a sifting going on. Jesus is sifting the church. He's separating the wheat from the chaff. Somebody say, I hear you. And that's why this message, this message is judgment. This message is judgment. And that's why everybody has got to be careful. You're a preacher, you're a man of God watching me. You've got to be careful. God is no respecter of persons. He said he will kill our children with her. He shows that that church will come to an end. It implies that that movement, that movement will not survive. That, that movement will not survive. And it is the responsibility of the church to stop it. 
believers rising with this revelation all of you catching this understanding it is our collective job to stop fraud and bring out the real message so that the lost can see jesus and be saved you need to know how many people have come to the knowledge of christ through this message we've preached in the last few years including muslims including people who have stayed away from church for years some of our brethren in our Abuja church, one of them, I was meeting with them, a few of them, just to share fellowship with the leadership of the church. As they gathered to share with me, I just started talking. One of them said, Papa, I had left church. I have not stepped into any church for three years. And I made up my mind, I will never go to church again. If that is all church is about, I'm not interested. I don't want to be part of it. Then I stumbled on your message. And then I couldn't stop listening. And then I couldn't stop listening. And then I became addicted. And that is how I got hooked. And I didn't go to church. I was just with your messages. Until the campus was starting. Somebody say, even me. Somebody say, even me. Somebody say, me too. All over the place. Almost all our members in the Abuja campus have not been going to church for years. They had given up on church. Until they heard the message. So you can imagine when all of us, with the nations of the world and people everywhere, will rise up to preach this message. The entire world will be taken over. Somebody shout, I hear you. Oh, glory to God. I'm excited. I'm excited, friends. Don't your neighbor say, this is a new day. Stand on your feet. Walk to two, three people. Tell them, this is a new day. This is a new day. This is a new day. I want you to speak it like a prophecy. And I want you to speak it by faith. This is a new day. It's a new day in the body of Christ. Oh, yes. This is a new day in the body of Christ. Glory to God. This is a new day in the body of Christ. I said, this is a new day in the body of Christ. I said, this is a new day in the body of Christ. I said, this is a new day in the body of Christ. I said, this is the day of Jesus. I said, this is the day of Jesus. Glory! 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 And I'm excited that God is gracious to us as a church to make us part of what God is doing right now. Oh yes, we could have been among those people doing all those things. God's grace and mercy. We could have been there eating the, in the table of devils. Feasting in the idolatry of, of, of Jezebel. We could have been there doing who stole my shoe. Koboko versus Koboko. Altar versus altar. We could have been there doing all those things. Could have been there doing bring 5,000 naira, raise an altar. Which altar? Altar, it means place of animal sacrifice. It's not money that raises altar. It's animal sacrifice. Don't you understand English? 5,000 raise altar. Altar for what? Who could have been there? But the grace of God. And that's why this same grace that has located us, we must make it locate others. Somebody shout, I hear you. Somebody say, I am graced to help others locate grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Oh, glory to God. Somebody shout hallelujah. I pray tonight all over the world in this building, on television, on Facebook, YouTube, all our campuses. I declare that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord among us will flood the earth as the water covers the sea. Every one of you continues to grow in grace. You continue to grow in knowledge. You continue to grow in the knowledge of Christ. In the name of Jesus, barriers are broken completely. I decree that the reality of your identity is rising big on your inside. The revelation of Jesus is flooding your heart, flooding your mind, flooding your environment. In the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you that grace has enabled us to come this far. And by grace, we will cause this world to hear the message of Christ. Thank you, Father, for the blessing. We are blessed beyond the cause. We are kept by the power of God. Thank you for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer says that, Amen, on a note of final letter. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Oh my goodness, what a service. I know you've been blessed by the word of his grace. Please, don't go away, don't go away. The essence of the teaching of God's word is to build you up, equip you, so you can do the work of ministry.
That's the whole essence. Not just to acquire knowledge and see that, but to teach you so you can teach others. Brother Paul says, the things that you have learned of me among many witnesses, the same you commit to others who shall also commit to others. Two things. Number one, if you don't belong to a Bible teaching church where the message of Christ is taught, where the revelation of Jesus is brought to you, then you either join one of our campuses or you can begin one in your community and become the lighthouse for other believers to assemble around and be fed and be taught the word. And today you want to join either a campus of ours or you want to start a campus. All you need to do is shoot me a mail, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com with your details. We shall get in touch with you and we shall walk with you, equip you and train you. And we shall walk you through establishing a campus or being a part of one of our already existing campuses in your locality. Lastly, I've written a number of books to address doctrinal issues and to answer questions that you might have. They're on the screen right now. Today, if you require any of those books, you want to order for them or all of them, or you want to order for our CDs or DVDs, shoot a mail also to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com requesting for the materials and our office will get in touch with you and see how they can work out getting the books to wherever you are around the world. I'm excited that I'm able to be a blessing to you today. Remember, I'm live here on Facebook every morning at 10 a.m. GMT plus one, 12 noon GMT plus one, 6 p.m. GMT plus one, and 10 p.m. GMT plus one. Many times a day, feeding you, feeding you, feeding you, equipping you, because we want you to come to a place of robust understanding of an effective relationship between you and God. Share with other people as you look forward to continuing to be a blessing in your life. And until I see you in the next broadcast, enjoy the rest of your day and be blessed. Amen. Amen to your victory.